Hey, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and my very special guest today is Josh Young, the founder and chief investment officer of Bison Interests uh, in Houston, Texas. Josh, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Just great. Just great. It's a beautiful day in Texas, as uh, they all seem to be. Um. Before we get into questions and answers about what's going on in the energy investment space right now, talk about Bison Interests, its history, how you ended up deciding to, to found the company and your background. Just give, give us a two or three minute primer. Sure. So um, I went to University of Chicago. I'm from L.A. originally, studied economics did uh, management consulting out of school, then private equity, then worked for a multi-billion dollar uh, family office, uh, ended up leading their energy investments and doing a number of uh, public equity energy investments along with other activities for them. Um, Launched a a hedge fund, (laughs) which failed gloriously uh, in the early uh, 2010s, Um, (laughs) then mostly did... um, uh, private investments, uh, lining up family offices to invest in uh, usually publicly traded oil and gas companies, but uh, sometimes convertible debt deals or private asset deals. I helped vend a Bakken asset to a rapidly growing public uh, Bakken focused company, just various sort of interesting off the run things. Um, In 2015, after the oil price crash in 2014, I partnered with an advisor to a number of my clients at the time uh, to launch Bison. The thought was that after oil prices crashed, there would be this, uh, there was a dislocation that we knew was temporary. We didn't know it would last this long. So we set up an opportunity fund. And the idea was energy opportunity to go buy oil and gas stocks that were down, let's say 70% at that point from their 2014 high. And the idea was that they may double or triple from there. And then we would sell and return capital. And that was in 2015. Uh, my business partner left and co-founder left in 2019 to go uh, pursue his next, uh, his next endeavor, I guess, sort of in line with our initial thought on time frame. And here I am uh, continuing to face into the storm years later. Well, uh, the last uh, couple of years have been a very interesting time uh, to be investing in oil and gas. We've, uh, I guess, been the, the the best performing sector in the whole market last year. And, uh, you know, what kind of a, what kind of an environment did that create for you and your business? Yeah, so um, in 2021, um, from the stats we saw, it looks like Bison may have been the best performing equity investment fund, um, at least in the US, if not the world. And again, there's an asterisk there. There's a lot of sort of caveats and whatever. But, um, you know, uh, we we were up, uh, I think it was 349% net that year, which was wild. I mean, look, we were down in 2020 and and oil and gas stocks were depressed. But um, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's been a real interesting, weird space. Uh, 2022 was actually not as good a year for us um, by a lot. And, you know, the first half started out strong. But, um, you know, I think I think there's not a lot of belief in this oil and gas bull market. And I think it's sort of been hated the whole way up. And it's definitely not been allocated <laughs> to or invested in from a sort of broad market or broad asset allocated perspective. So, yeah, it's been really it's sort of this weird thing where like the better we do as an industry, the better Bison does, the less interesting it is, which again is sort of as a contrarian, it's wonderful. As a business owner, it's maybe not so much. And uh, I think eventually that'll turn and uh, it's just a matter of time. So how much of that uh, hatred of this rally in, in oil stocks has to do with the whole ESG investment philosophy in these big investment houses? I mean, is that a big factor there? I think I think it's it's more just a psychological like price drives narrative thing where Uh typically the first third of a bull market, it's hated and everyone just thinks it's getting ready for another crash. And we were dealing with that with the broader equity market right now, where it's unclear if it's a bear market rally that we're in or a new bull market for equities. And I don't really have a strong view on that. And, you know, I sort of joke that my equity crystal ball and short term crystal ball are broken. Um, but, you know, it is it is notable that in 2009, if you said, hey, I'm buying stocks, people thought you were crazy. Um, you know, in 2002 or 2003, if you said you were buying stocks, people 
people thought you were crazy. I listened through to lots of different speeches by various high net worth people and other you know successful people who talked about how equities were dead and how it was gambling and horrible. So I think it's sort of a similar thing where you know prices have done well, but we're still way below where we were in 2014. And the market's way above, the broad equity market's way above where we were in 2014. So I think I think we'll start to get some traction when the overall oil and gas equity market has actually outperformed the broader market over a 10-year uh, period. So I think we got the next couple of years to, to really catch up. And I think that'll happen. I think it's pretty likely. The returns may be phenomenal if that happens. And I think that's really, I think the ESG thing is just people tell themselves stories to try to rationalize why they feel the way they feel and yeah. so it's really it's just the latest excuse for oh i didn't own that and it's done really well here's why and it's something that makes them feel good it's a story that people tell each other rather than um rather than from what i can tell a real uh, impetus so i i saw a report two three days ago now and i apologize i'm not going to remember be able to cite where i saw it but it, it was some research that had been done that indicated the the average return. I think it was over the past two years by uh, ESG focused funds it was lagging non ESG funds on average by about two percentage points. Uh, is is that something you've seen? Um, and, and I don't. I honestly can't tell you where I even saw it. Whether it was on TV or radio or what. But uh, I, I is is. From your research, are ESG funds performing as well as non-ESG funds, funds that, you know, include the whole market rather than discriminating against certain stock classes? Yeah. So, so one of the interesting things is that almost all funds became ESG funds uh, when funds were getting uh, allocated to, to that uh, sort of theme, similar to how a lot of funds are now and companies are now magically artificial intelligence. There's some, uh, you know, commodity analysis firm that claims that they have a neural network that can predict shale well productivity. And it just, I mean, <laughs> it's just buzzwords, right? Like it's not like, and actually their analysis was like precisely wrong. I tweeted about this earlier where it's just like, Hey, here's an exact opposite example, right? Like what they, they mean something else, but it sounds good. So ESG, I think it's complicated, right? The broader market's down a little. Um, and the companies that were included in ESG are, are typically companies that are actually not very environmentally friendly. They don't treat their people well. They're not well governed, but somehow they end up you know, through the magic of not producing hydrocarbons or uh, you yeah. know, certain other, you know, sort of like negative buzzwords. Um, if you you know, don't do that, then you're in this sort of ESG group. So I think a lot of that is related to um, market performance. And the really interesting thing is that there is this supposed inflation and uh, inflation prevention act or whatever, which is the uh, inflation production act really, um, which uh, <laughs> is, is throwing hundreds of billions of dollars right now in stimulus to these uh, you know, solar companies and wind yeah. companies and various like nonsense technologies that are super low uh, energy return on investment, like hydrogen, which doesn't even work or geothermal, where I know the people and they're like, yeah, we'll take the money, but <laughs> it's not doing anything. <laughs> um, so, so for those stocks to not be massively outperforming, even with hundreds of billions of dollars a year being thrown at them right now, um, actively, like it's not something that happened last year or five years ago. It's like it's new money coming in and it's money that should get priced into equity valuations for those stocks to not be obviously massively outperforming, I think, is indicative of just the enormous malinvestment as well as the, um, I think, risk of substantial potential negative returns. Oh, and then just one caveat. None of this is an offering or a solicitation. I'm just, you know, we're just sharing uh, thoughts and uh, right. help, helping educate the public. Yeah, yeah, I guess we should have done that disclaimer up front. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't have that. My mind's not focused that way. I just get on and talk. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, if you're not following Josh Young on Twitter, he mentioned his Twitter account a minute ago. Uh, you're really missing out on some tremendous information, not just about investment, but, but, but just about energy and what's happening in the energy space in general. I've been following him for a year, and I, he's one of my first reads every morning, Josh, you, you really do a great job. And I've, I've actually <laughs> used a couple of your charts and a couple of my Forbes pieces. So it's really, really great stuff. And y'all should be following him. Um, 
So, so let's, one thing you've been talking about, and I'm not sure what you mean, so I, I want to roll this out here. You, you've talked about the small versus large cap divide in energy stocks. And I want you to explain to me what you mean by that. Sure. So um, one of the big movements in the finance world in the last few decades has been moving from active managers, so mutual funds, hedge fund managers, uh, even using your broker to help you buy individual stocks towards indexing. So putting money into ETFs and index funds to sort of match the broader market performance. And there's a number of good things about that, which is that most managers underperform their benchmarks. That's sort of one of the things we're most proud of at Bison. So since we launched, uh, we're up, let's say 130% versus XOP, which is sort of the investable ETF for oil and gas stocks down about 30%. And again, you know, just illustrative, the goal isn't to you write me a check. The goal is to explain sort of that it is possible to outperform. The, the, the statistics are that almost all active managers materially underperform. So what's happened is wealth managers um, who are, generally trying to do the right thing for their clients are are shifting over uh, capital to index funds. And the most popular by far um, overall over time has been a sort of S&P 500 uh, index fund, which sort of uh, funnels money into the 500 biggest publicly traded oil or not oil and gas, 500 biggest publicly traded companies uh, here in the U.S., And so among the oil and gas companies, uh, the ones that are biggest are seeing the most inflows because funds aren't really flowing into sector ETFs like XOP or XLE. I mean, those have gotten a little bigger, but the the predominant sort of flow of funds is towards these large companies in the, the stock market and the larger oil and gas companies are sort of getting hit by those flows. And so you have this very weird thing where we're in the early stages of an oil bull market, where in past early stages, small caps dramatically outperformed large caps and valuations uh, sort of reflected that where you'd see, I, I had lunch with the CEO of a, a Canadian oil company uh, on Saturday, and he was telling me about how at this stage in the last bull market, his stock was at like nine times EBITDA. Now it's at two and a half times. So nine times essentially operating cash flow uh, before interest or tax or depreciation. And so, um, you know, that's a huge difference. And the interesting thing is the large caps in some cases are at run rate sort of seven times operating cash flow or EBITDA. And so, um, you know, there's this big divide. The small caps, many of them are trading at sort of two or three times EBITDA. There aren't really good mechanisms. So we've tried to use PSCE, which is a sort of junky ETF. I'm, I'm never recommending anything, but particularly <laughs> that one's like, we're using it as an indication of just how much small caps have underperformed, but there's not even a good real mechanism to get exposure to that through the ETF space. And so um, you know, if PSE were to catch up with XOP, for example, it would have to go up, I think, something like 300% for it to catch up to XOP's multi-year performance. And so there's this big divide in valuations and big divide in sort of the, the representative ETFs or indexes. And I think it has to do with sort of a change in capital market structure where there's sort of so much more money that's gone into these ETFs that's chasing uh, large companies and the large oil and gas companies are a part of that. Um, But also the deep unpopularity of oil and gas makes it really, I mean, there's just, there should be a better small cap and mid cap ETF or ETFs um, and they just don't exist really. And so uh, if people want to allocate money, it's a real, it's a real problem. And it's not that that problem is translating to a real disparity. What we're seeing is now big companies trading at large, at high valuations are buying smaller ones very aggressively. I think we're going to see a merger boom. And that's sort of what we're writing our next white paper on. And uh, that's why we've been talking about this so much. I mean, look, we own the small ones because we like cheap stocks, but yeah. regardless of what we own or not, it's just if one thing trades at seven times and one thing trades at two times, if they go pay four or five, they're going to get that uplift. And so, and and every time in almost every cycle, you see that happen. So I think yeah. it's not, this this time isn't different. So you you think we're about to have a, a real, I know merger activity has been pretty soft here for a year now. You think that's about to change? 
Yeah, I mean, actually, merger activity uh, so far this year hasn't been that soft, and we're seeing a lot more activity. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, investment bankers and lawyers being really busy over the holidays and first part of the year, and Good. we're starting to see some deals show up. And I would not be surprised if there were much larger deals. And again, I have no uh, off-market information about any of this, but you know, you can just sort of tell through these sort of soft uh, legal indicators uh, that that it, that stuff like this is happening. And again, just theoretically you can tell because if you have this sort of giant valuation gap uh, yeah. that's going to get closed and people will again try to rationalize these things they'll say oh well the big companies have more inventory but then you know we tried to dispel that that pushback too the big companies book more inventory so they might actually have less land but they have more uh, available liquidity and so they they're more careful in terms of counting all their different well locations where some of the small companies underbook their inventory in some cases substantially and so there's it's just like as you pick apart this argument of like why should um why should larger companies be more highly valued you get back to this sort of price driving narrative aspect and that's very exciting as a fundamental investor and i think it's interesting as an energy market sort of uh commenter as well when these sorts of things they get sort of overextended and just everyone believes in them and they won't even really reconsider or they'll call companies in one class like various negative names and <laughs> people who invest in them names and it's, so it's really you know i think it th that's a very promising environment in which to play capital Excellent, excellent. Well, listen, I want to talk about oil markets. I couldn't help noticing that the uh, International Energy Agency once again increased its uh, projection for uh, crude oil demand increase for 2023 and 2024. Now, I guess they must be projecting over 102 million barrels a day average uh, demand during 2023, right? Yeah, something like that. I don't yeah. I don't remember those numbers. I, I track them obviously, but I don't uh they, they change so much <laughs> that I don't really track them yeah. uh, by memory. I try actually not to do that because uh you know it's easy to be precisely wrong because you know that I think that might have been the EIA that changed their forecast. It, it was, was EIA. EIA, excuse me. I I yeah, I'm sorry. Uh no, but yeah. it's okay. Either way, both of them have been wrong. Both of them keep underestimating yeah. uh, oil demand. And uh, so I actually, I posted about that on Twitter and one of my friends was like, oh, they're actually still understating it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. That just means that the demand <laughs> estimates are going up more. And she's like, well, that's wrong. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, okay. But if you just understand what's happening, you have this weird narrative still of, oh, it's going away. And right begrudgingly, even government agencies where their mandate is to accurately report information are just sandbagging these numbers over and over and over again. And so it's very weird. Look, I'm not that optimistic about the US and world economies. I think we'll do fine, but maybe not great. And there is a downside risk. But even with that, if you look at the absurdly low estimates and the ridiculous claims around, oh, it's going away or there's not going to be an oil demand recovery similar to the last times there was you know, uh, oil demand disruption. I mean, it's just they're just wrong and you can measure it and they just keep being wrong over and over again. So it's very it makes it very easy to be bullish, I think, at this part of the cycle where we're just we're like it's like Wiley e. Coyote running off the edge of the cliff and it just keeps running, <laughs> even though there is a gravity, which is that the world uses oil. Emerging markets need oil. Poor people, as they use more, their lives get better. Um, and so no surprise, they use even more when they're able to. And so, um, you know, I think there's just this sort of like theory, which is off the cliff and there's a reality which is pulling it down and in this case that pulling it down is oil prices eventually going higher and oil and gas equities going much higher yeah one of the interesting things you've done here in recent months is is uh you know you've been looking at uh, china reopening and tracking that and and one of the ways you've done that which which i i, I enjoyed watching you know take it's one, one of the reasons why i've latched on to your twitter feed so much is tracking their flight activity, right in China, as as a gauge of the 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 pace of the reopening. Where do, where do you think China is? What first of all, why did you latch on to that idea as a way to 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 track the pace of the reopening? And where do you think China stands now in terms of getting its economy fully reopened? So so I'll I'll just explain a little. Like my Twitter feed is partially just sort of 
sharing some early research ideas ahead of uh, you know putting them together as white papers and publishing them. Sometimes it's relevant in terms of researching various specific investments that we're looking at. And it's a wonderful way to get feedback and to sort of figure out if we're missing something or, yeah. you know, to get additional sort of information or confirmation, disconfirmation through essentially crowdsourcing. So it's a wonderful, you know, I guess like we we share a lot, but there's there's a lot we're not sharing, but there's also a lot that we get out of the um, Twitter community and through through sort of contributing in that way. So. Uh, flight tracking is something we've done for actually a few years, and you know it's something where you could sort of tell early on that there was a problem for oil in, let's say, February 2020 by looking at how flights were falling off. And, yeah. you know, um, I, I can't say we went and shorted oil or anything like that, but it was something that we were aware of. And we fortunately got into tankers sort of on the early side and didn't lose quite as much as we could have if we weren't sort of ready for it to some extent. Um, so it's something we've done for a while. And um, it was becoming sort of better known. So there was less edge, I think, in terms of tracking it and understanding the trajectory. And then there were also weird narratives saying that there were never uh, many macro economists and forecasters and pundits were saying China was never going to reopen. Um, and, and it's just fun <laughs> sort of to track these shifts. Often they'll try to like delete their things they've shared or their whatever. But, you know, China there were like sort of these conflicting concurrent narratives of China isn't reopening or China's already at max oil consumption or, um, you know, I don't know what, but anyway, Chinese flights, when I started posting it, were at sort of 4,000 daily domestic flights. The forecast was, Hey, they're going to over the next year. Um, and really by the end of 2023, they were going to get back to their, uh, 15,000 daily flights that they were at pre COVID. And, you know, I mean, it was remarkable. We actually thought they would recover slower. They went from 4,000, I think it was daily flights when I started sharing that in, I think it was November, October, something like that to now we're over 12,000 daily flights. And then the passenger numbers are rising too. One of the arguments was, oh, they're flying empty flights. Sort of the argument about China building empty cities. You know, most of the cities people claimed were empty five years ago are full. And lo and behold, they flew flights. And so people showed up and started buying those tickets. First, they were very cheap and now they're less cheap. And, you know, passenger numbers are through the roof. And we're just starting to see the next wave of international flights uh, get restarted here at the start of March. And so, um, you know, I think we're we're well on track to 15,000. And when you look at the orders for new planes and so on, um, you know, we should get way over that over the next few years. And we should get to a global flight number that's way higher. And from an oil consumption and jet fuel consumption number, uh, there's two things to keep in mind. One is a bunch of old planes that were taken out of commission because they weren't so fuel efficient are getting brought back in as way more flight demand is there than people expected. Also, they tend to be sort of some of the bigger planes. And if you have a limited number of pilots, it's way better to have, let's say, 400 people on a plane than it is to have 50 people on a plane if you have one pilot to, uh, to fly. And again, that's not extensible uh, like broadly, but there are sort of specific examples where that's changing. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is as there's more passengers on planes, it's not just the jet fuel, it's also how people get to and from airports and what they do where, wherever it is that they go. And so it's a good proxy. There's probably a sort of three to one or two to one uh, demand increase where whatever the jet fuel is that they're using, you end up with two or three times as much gasoline or diesel demand from the various activities that they engage in, whether it's uh, vacation or work travel or whatever. And so, uh, you know, a, a million barrels a day of incremental jet fuel demand may lead to like three or so million barrels a day of total sort of uh, gasoline, diesel and jet fuel demand. So that's why it matters so much. And that's yeah. sort of how you know those EIA numbers are way too low. <laughs> well, and I, I've tended to agree with that, but but, but didn't really have uh, uh, a lot of detailed knowledge to understand why I agree with that. Uh, but I, you know, I, I wonder what your view is on the direction oil prices are going to head over the next few months. I, it seems to me the way things are shaping up with the, with China, the robust demand coming back from China and everything else that's happening in the world, uh, and us going into uh, summer driving season soon, it, it seems likely crude prices are probably going to be headed north here in, in the next few months. But I wonder what your view is. 
So I have a crystal ball I bought on Amazon and when I consult it, it doesn't work. And then <laughs> yeah, um, me too. <laughs> this, one of my, one of my Twitter followers, uh, I got to know real well. He's a asset allocator, semi-retired. He sent me this, uh, little gas station, uh, amaranth branded. Um, so I have this little gas pump that has amaranth on it. So these are reminders that, um, the short term is inherently unknowable. And um, so while I personally believe that oil prices should rise as oil consumption rises, there are lots of realities that can come up in the short term, whether it's a economic dislocation or a war like we like started last year or various other factors that could lead oil prices in any direction. So I think on a multi-year basis, oil prices need to go way higher because there's yeah. just not enough development activity to be able to yield enough oil versus even current demand. And then demand does tend to rise by a little over a million barrels a day every year, just sort of in the natural, um, you know, uh, enrichment of India and China and various other places with very poor people improving their lives. And so over time, oil prices are going to weigh higher. Uh, it is actually a little surprising to me that oil oil is as low as it is right now, a little below $80 a barrel, um, but it could go a lot lower in the short term. It could go a lot higher in the short term. And I think there's really, there's this sort of, um, we all want like something to latch onto. And so we make these sort of short-term predictions, but I think I think there's a freedom in understanding that these things are inherently unknowable. And then just back to social media, it's funny, right? You find some like important fundamental statistic or change or inflection in oil demand or policy or whatever and share it and people say oh but the price of oil is down over this x period right with <laughs> that day that week and say like, no that's not really that's not how it works it's not the price is is not forecasting a future price the price is what's the clearing price for oil right this second and there, there's a lot of real specifics. So yeah, do I think oil prices should go higher? Yes, but there's a real possibility they go lower or stay flat before they go higher. And I think there's just a real unknowability around sort of uh, that whole price forecasting world. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, what I always tell people when they ask me where, where oil prices are going or gas prices are going, what I always tell them is if I knew that, I would be as as wealthy as as Elon Musk, if if I knew that, if anyone knew that, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to be doing podcasts for a living. <laughs> it just, you know, it's just not it's not the the, the way the world works. But uh, one last thing, natural gas. I assume you also follow natural gas prices. Um, you know, we had that that spike last year uh, in natural gas prices, and now the collapse back down to this kind of zone where it's been for a decade now. Um, do you see any hope for gas producers of stronger prices, you know, in over the next several years, or are we just kind of stuck on this treadmill for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so we've seen folks with the, the neural network analysis of shale oil productivity also had this like theory about the convergence of U.S. and European natural gas prices, which... Um, yeah. <laughs> clearly hasn't happened. Uh, you know, both have fallen, but U.S. natural gas prices have fallen a lot more than than European, and there are some structural factors that should keep that. I, I think. I think the issue is that well productivity on the gas side has stayed very strong, and even yeah. as there's been core depletion in the Marcellus, uh, some of the improvements in well productivity in the Haynesville and elsewhere have been phenomenal. So credit to the oil food services professionals, credit to the oil and gas companies that have really helped innovate that. Um, and then associated gas from shale wells is increasing, not decreasing. And so you sort of have this production wave that's way above where consensus forecasts were. And so it's just really hard to have very strong pricing. This is something I've talked about for a number of months and sort of <laughs> people are like, wait a second, aren't you bullish on commodities? It's like, well, not all commodities are the same. So do I think <laughs> Do I think that 250 natural gas or something like that is sustainable? No, I think prices need to go up over the next, let's say, 18 months, closer to $4 or so just to incentivize some dry gas development. Um, but and, and then once LNG exports start coming on in scale, there's a next build wave that's happening that's supposed to start coming on in late 2024, but realistically, let's say, uh, will have come on in size by early 26. I'd say by that point, there's a decent chance of balancing the natural gas market. And at that point, we might see prices closer to what we saw last year. But I think it could be pretty rough for a little while. Um, 
And, you know, I would expect significant current uh, continued volatility where gas prices could go way lower than they are right now. They could go way higher temporarily, but there's going to be there's going to be a, a significant sort of suppression of the market, even if um, the winter had been normal and not warmer than normal. And even if Freeport LNG had stayed on, you know, I think we'd be in sort of a four dollar natural gas price environment and not the nine dollar or so that we saw last yeah. year. So yeah. I think it's a it's a tough market. People want to be bullish. I'm very bullish oil. I just think, I think natural gas short to medium term is just, uh, it's the producers are doing too good of a job. They're drilling too many phenomenal wells. Well productivity stepped up meaningfully in the Haynesville. Uh, and then uh, in the Midcon, there's been some great wells and the Permian natural gas production is, I think it's at an all time high. So, yeah. um, you know, I just think they're doing a great job and that means uh, it's great for US producers. I listened to a podcast you were on, you talked about how it's, really great for the U.S. sort of manufacturing renaissance and North American manufacturing renaissance. So it's wonderful for our um, industry and for the U.S. economy, but it's it's pretty tough for the producers. And I don't see that changing in the medium term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that uh, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, it just feels like that's kind of where we are. We just have so much natural gas in this country. It's it's people don't understand the magnitude of the resource. It's it's truly phenomenal. Um, well, not just that. It's also the the people and the technology. There's really just a yeah. lot of credit that's owed to these people. And, and that's where this sort of neural network analysis sort of messed up. It's not... It's not all about the rock. It's about what you do with it. And, yeah. you know, there's rock that people had really discarded or said, for example, was second tier Haynesville that's now producing just as much or more than the historic core of the Haynesville, for example. So, you know, is that core rock better? Yes. But is that second tier rock producing just as much at like a reasonable cost? Yes. Why? Well, there's great people with great technology. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of pressure to do better. And those are, I mean, th that's what's great about America. And it's really wonderful. You know, it's tough for those producers that they're realizing low prices, but it's really, I think it just can't be said enough. There's just phenomenal innovation and really great people. And, you know, I bet on people and I'm bullish oil and I'm bullish on the ability for people and technology to solve difficult problems. Yeah, me too. And it's, you know, when you understand the history of the oil and gas business, it's been a very common theme for the, for the oil and gas industry over the years is innovating its way out of problems and, and just developing new technologies and, and improved techniques to, to maximize production and drill yourself out of a out of a high price, you know, which which it has done repeatedly historically. And uh, so here we are again with natural gas. Yeah. Well, and I'm, then, you know, in terms of drilling ourselves out, sorry, I'll, this will just be the last point. Uh, I think I think there is a risk that we do eventually drill ourselves out of high prices for oil, but we're in such a deep hole from having done way too little on exploration and yeah. exploration over the last 10 years that we have, <laughs> we need to start drilling a lot and we have a long ways to go to backfill, to refill reserves and to refill um, uh, production capacity to be able to meet the needs that we're likely to see over the next five years. So I think even believing in technology and people, we just need a lot more capital and a lot more activity for a bunch of years before we're going to get to that point again. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think you're right. And yeah, we could have a real, could have a real bottleneck at some point, a real uh, supply demand issue uh, in the, in the market. I think uh, it could create a bit of a crisis, but Hey, you know, it, you know, how, how long has our industry ever gone without a good crisis? So uh, here we go again, probably. Listen, man, we're out of time. I really appreciate you doing this. This has been great. Uh, I want to have you again here in the in the months to come, and uh, when there's a good inflection point to to talk about some more. And I uh, uh, wish you the best of luck, and really appreciate you coming on. Thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you all to our viewers and listeners, and to our uh, folks at Sandstone who produce our show and our our. Extraordinary producer, Eric Perel. I'm David Blackman signing off for now. We will see you next time.